All right, good morning, everyone. Um, before we get started, uh, there's just a couple of things I want to go over. Uh, the first is we're going to go over some abnormal operations on the engine. So if you would pull out your uh, ETD if you brought it, it'll be a little helpful. Under the RIQ publications tab on the good reader, there's the flight and then down uh, the very bottom one, T6 develop checklist. It should look something like this. Does everyone see that? If you don't see it, tap the EP in the upper right and you'll see the, the drop down. Okay, that is the caution and warning system panel on the T6. So when we talk about malfunctions, many of those will either be a hot button here, like if I was to touch uh, Genbus, it'll take me right to that checklist. Or if I go uh, into the engine section, it's gonna be talking about all of the things that we have like PMU failure and fault. So those are some checklist that I will be referencing when we get to those, okay? Anyone having difficulty with what I just kind of whipped through in about two seconds? Okay. All right, so just like the slide says, we're gonna talk a little bit about the engine. So your CBTs yesterday afternoon after the aircraft tour, you should have been able to walk through that. So is, is there any overarching questions about the CBT stuff? That everyone says, I have a burning question and I want to answer it. Do we have any of that yet? Okay, go ahead. Um, as such, I'm asking it because there was a couple of us who had this question. Um, so going through the propulsion tube, and they were talking about RPMs, the PCL, what exactly, as far as like controlling RPMs, what, ex what exactly controls the RPMs? Because it seems like there's a consistent 2,000 RPMs in the engine at all times. When you increase the PCL or you decrease it, it doesn't seem to affect that 2,000 RPM. Correct. So the RPMs are consistent at all times, and the only thing that's being changed is the pitch. Is that correct? The pitch of the prop. So when you push forward on the PCL, that tells the PMU that we need to increase the pitch to make the plane go faster. Pretty close. You're mixing a little bit of terminology. So the question he's asking is when I advance the PCL, i.e. the power control lever, up to a higher power setting, what is actually happening? So when we're pushing up the PCL, the PMU, the brains behind keeping that near linear progression, which we're going to cover here in a minute, the power management unit schedules the amount of fuel. It talks to the PIU, the pitch interface unit, which is up on top. If you guys remember uh, from the aircraft tour yesterday, it regulates the amount of oil pressure to change the pitch. So all of those things are working in unison. Now it is a constant speed propeller. So when you advance the power, it's going to change the pitch of the prop to take a bigger bite of air. So the way I kind of equate it to is who's been canoeing? Anyone been canoeing? Okay, so when I take my boat oar and I'm digging it in and the paddle is flat, it takes a lot of force to push that. Well, at high density altitudes and low air speeds, if I just jam the PCL up, the propeller just can't physically turn fast enough to compensate if it's straight pushing all of that air. So it has to change the canter of it to allow it to take a smaller bite based on where it's at power-wise. So obviously, the more power that the engine is able to produce uh, once it's stabilized at a high power setting, it's going to be able to take a bigger bite of air. Does that make sense? So those things are all working in concert, and we're going to go through kind of how all of that works. And I've got a good schematic that shows the pitch change mechanism as well. Good question. Anything else? All right, we'll get started. So just like most of the material that as we walk through it, we're going to talk about how things work normally, and then we're going to talk about some of the things that can go wrong, because you as the pilot have to be able to deal with the stuff that goes wrong. That's why you guys get extra money, extra pay. I'm not sure about the Marines. You guys don't get extra money. Sorry. All right. But your Air Force buddies here get extra money for it. Okay, so there was a question yesterday somebody brought up about the intake of the aircraft taking in exhaust. The exhaust port is up here. The air intake is just underneath the propeller spinner. 
this is the where the air enters and then goes up and into the engine. So there is no exhaust that is taken into the engine. So we're going to talk about all these things. All right, what do, where did I leave off yesterday? I'll start with you. What are the ingredients I need to, to, for the engine to operate? Air, fuel. Yeah, air, fuel, and heat. Okay, so <clears throat> air comes in through the air intake that we showed you on the, uh, the cowling in through the starter generator initially, and then it's sustained as airflow enters the aircraft. Fuel, obviously, the initial part of it comes from the boost pump out of the collector tank and goes up into the engine. And then heat, in the form of spark, comes from your igniters, which are in the igniter box, igniting the fuel. So those are the ingredients I need for engine operation. If you uh, want to refer to the engine cutaway, the dash one has a really good schematic drawing of the engine cutaway, and I'll be re referencing talking about some of those issues. It's on page 1-13 in the dash one, not the, not the checklist. Air, fuel, and heat, correct. All right, so we have the accessory compartment. That's that shiny compartment just aft of the Folgers can looking starter generator. In the accessory compartment, you've got the low and high pressure engine driven fuel pumps, the oil pump, the hydraulic pump, those are where all the accessories live to include the starter generator. The gas generation se section is also the compression and combustion chamber for the engine. And then you've got the power turbine section. So there's really three sections of the engine. There's the accessory, the gas generation, and the power turbine section. One thing to note, and I think we'll cover it here in a little bit, notice that the gas generation section and the power turbine section are not physically connected. There's no physical connection there. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. So how does it work? Well, initially the starter turns the compressor. Notice these stator blades and these different sections here just keep working the air tighter and tighter and tighter. So this is the compression section. These blades get smaller as the air matriculates through the engine. Once the gas is compressed, it goes into the combustion section. Air is compressed, then it's mixed with the fuel. And then it's hard to tell, but up in here is where the igniters ignite the fuel, and that's where the combustion that's where the combustion happens. So when it when it combusts, that air flows back through, turns the compressor section and the power turbines. So the combustion happens here, then it flows back, and then comes back through here, turning all three of those stators. It's ignited. The expanding gases drive the compress compressor turbine, which is this one right here, and then it also drives the power turbine. This is important to know. It drives the compressor and the power turbines. It drives both of them. You may see that in the future. I'm just guessing. And then the power turbines themselves drive the propeller through the reduction gearbox. So this is spinning about 30,000 RPM. And then it goes into the reduction gearbox, which is up near the front part of the, of the engine. And that's where those gearing mechanisms drive it down to 2,000 RPM. The bottom of the reduction gearbox, there's a spark plug looking element. That is your chip detector. So there's a lot of meshing that's going on in here. So it's logical that in the bottom of that oil sump, there'd be something that would be magnetic that would pick up those foreign bits of metal if that's, if that's indeed the case. And then the exhaust ports, they're located over here. It, it kind of cut it off, but they curve to that round ring and then they're exhaust, exhausted aft of the aircraft. 
You have to memorize this chart. No, a lot of this stuff is already um, in your ops limits and in your bold face. You're going to have to know most of that when you hit the flight line, okay? Just the engine limitations. Big ones to note here, uh, the PMU regulates based on the weight of wheels, the idle N1 or the core, air, core speed of the engine between 60 and 61. In flight, when there's no weight on wheels, flight idle is 67 N1, so it has a higher core RPM. That's pretty much all I wanted to cover on that. The engine operating limits not only are on that limitations sheet that you guys have been feverishly filling out, grab that and hold that up for your compadres. That's where the ops limits are that you guys are need to be responsible on the back of that sheet. If you want to know all of the engine limitations and the aircraft limitations, that's section five of the dash one. So all of section five is all of your operating limits. And that's where this chart comes from. All right, the igniters. You've got your ignition exciter, you've got the ignition cables, and then you've got the spark igniter. So basically, <clears throat> it takes a low voltage input from the exciter, that's the exciter, through the, through the uh, ignition wire, sends it to the igniter. This is the igniter right here, if you guys can see the little mouse arrow. And then that's what ignites the fuel in the combustion section of the, of the aircraft. Think of it like a, a spark plug on your car, if you will. You got a 12, 12 volt battery uh, to a, a, a cable, and then it's to the spark plug, and that gives a high voltage spark, if you will. So the same thing can be true here. What are these little copper lines right here? What are these things? Does anybody know? The fire loops, fire loop one and fire loop two. We're gonna talk a little bit about that when we get to the abnormal section. All right, kind of a poor schematic, but a couple of things to note. If you in the front cockpit move the PCL fore and aft, the rear cockpit one moves as well because they're interconnected. And then this, is, this portion of the PCL is connected to the FMU or fuel management unit. It's a physical connection. Normally, the PMU will schedule all of the required fuel, but in the event that the PMU fails, now you, pilot, are in charge of scheduling fuel to the engine. So the way this is dis depicted here, I'm sitting in the cockpit like on this side of the, of the rail, and I'm grabbing. So it's coming out of the screen towards you. I didn't design it, okay. So here's what it looks like. Ooh, ah. Yep, so we spared no expense for your training. So that was obviously four, and then this is the idle position. This is the PCL cutoff finger lift, and that's the PCL cutoff finger lift guard. So that has to be pushed down out of the way, then the PCL cutoff finger lift lifted up, and then put in the cutoff position. We had a lot of inadvertent engine shutdowns in the early 2000s flying this airplane. So um, the mishap boards uh, said we needed something like that, so they've installed that on all the aircraft. So does anyone need to see that again, how the PCO? OK. This is a good cutaway. Normally, in the aircraft in the hangar, you cannot see the PMU. It looks like this and it's mounted up underneath the uh, middle part of the engine. It looks just like an iPad. All right, the PMU is the brains of, basically the brain for the engine. All right, it takes all of the inputs that the pilot's giving, provided that it's on and working properly, and it schedules the fuel, it schedules the PIU to change the pitch change mechanism, i.e. the pitch of the prop, it schedules the FMU, how much fuel to go to the engine. So it keeps all of those items in check and it keeps the engine within operating limits. It does one other thing. It provides a near linear power flow for engine application. Let me say that again. It provides a near linear power application for the engine. There's a really good schematic here. So again, it maintains the engine within operating limits 
and this chart, if you can kind of keep this straight, this is when the PMU is on. I'm scheduling power and it's very linear as far as me advancing the power. If the PMU is off, I run the risk of not only over torquing the engine, but it's very hard to fly a very precise power setting just because this width is very, very narrow and you get a lot of change in a short amount of throw. Does that make sense? So obviously we fly with the PMU on. When the PMU doesn't work or it's failed, you can still fly the aircraft. You pilot have to keep the engine within operating limits. You can't just throttle burst or PCL burst because you would obviously exceed engine limitations. Any questions on that? Sir, is that something we're going to have to practice to get the simulators flying the PMU off? Um, on your EP sim, that may be something that your instructor will throw at you. He may fail that and then you know, force you to keep the engine within limitations. All right, the pitch change mechanism. We're going to go through the components and then you're going to see kind of how it all works. So there's a fixed cylinder that, that houses the feathering spring and the pitch change, um, the piston, excuse me. So this is the feathering spring right here, obviously, and then that's the pitch cylinder or piston, if you will. There's the sliding piston I just talked about inside of that uh, fixed cylinder. You also have the feathering spring. The fork assembly is a fancy term for how the propeller is connected to the actual physical housing. There's the cam follower, which rotates with it. It's basically a balancing mechanism, mechanical balancing on the propeller. So again, this piston and feathering spring cylinder it has oil pressure that allows it to compress and, and relax. The PIU is responsible for changing that oil pressure via inputs from the PMU. So if you increase the oil pressure, what's going to happen in this situation? Yeah, it's going to compress this piston and then the cam follower and propeller are going to rotate out of the feathered position. This is currently in the feathered position. Feather just means it's not, it's just streamlined with the airflow. The wind obviously would be coming in like this and it's not generating any, any drag or power for that matter. Okay, so what happened? We increased the oil pressure. The oil filled up behind here, pushed the plunger down, and then the prop rotated. This is a fine position. So there's fine, coarse, and feather. This is fine. Coarse would be probably something at a 45 or 60 degree angle. And then feather is streamlined into the wind. We good on all those terms? So obviously, as you're manipulating the PCL, the PMU, is telling, the PMU is telling the PIU, hey, you need to either increase or decrease pressure appropriately in here to change the pitch of the propeller to maintain that constant 2,000 RPMs. And that goes to the question you were asking. Sir? Uh, so fine increases enough for us? Fine is more the idle type setting. If I push up the power, then I'm going to get a cor usually a coarser. I'm cutting more air. Fine, I'm not in this position. I'm not cutting very much. I'm only cutting a small sliver of air. The air is coming this way. So what do you think is happening? If I pull the power back to idle and I go to a fine setting, that propeller blade is working like a drag device. It doesn't. Feather, don't get confused by the feather position. The feather position is I've depressurized this cylinder and allowed the prop to come all the way back, streamline into the wind. Once the aircraft is 
out, once the PCL is out of the cutoff range and it's between idle and max, it's going to operate between fine and coarse. That's where the propeller stays. Once you go to the cutoff position or if the feather dump solenoid fails, the propeller will go to feather. It's not, it's not intuitive. It's not, I advance it and that's what I get. That's the idle position. So if I was to advance the PCL, this is going to start to rotate to start cutting more air. And then when I don't need it to cut anymore, or I'm shutting off the engine, then it goes to feather. That's the PIU that sits up on top of the engine. That's the device that the PMU tells to change that amount of oil pressure going in and out of the pitch change mechanism. All right. That's the engine in a nutshell. Any questions so far? Sir? So when the PCL is brought back, it tells the PMU to change the oil pressure for the, or the, it tells the, the PMU tells the PIU change the oil pressure for the uh, pitch of the propeller. Okay. Yes. So as I'm reducing, let's say I'm, I'm in a high power setting using my PCL. I, I retard the PCL back to a lower power setting. That's telling the PMU, hey, I no longer need as much power as you're producing. So in order to compensate for that, it's telling the FMU, the fuel, fuel management unit, hey, I don't need as much fuel. So you can start r bringing that back. Hey, PIU, you need to take the pitch of the prop and change that towards a more fine setting. So it's doing all of that stuff automatically. Mm -hmm. It has to be done simultaneous. Why, though? Why is that all done simultaneous? There you go, to keep it at 2,000 RPM. So your prop is always spinning at 2,000 RPM. So as you're jockeying the throttle around, all of those things are happening. The fuel is being managed properly. The PIU is changing the pitch of the propeller. It's providing the right amount of torque for your current power setting. So all those things are, are in concert. That's a good question. Who's the brains behind keeping all that stuff going? The and the engine start. The PMU. All right. Engine displays, which, what are the three engine displays I have in the T6? Primary engine data display, alternate, alternate engine data display, engine systems display. Okay, just so that we don't get confused, let's just go through that. Primary engine data display, the most important engine instrument is the primary engine data display, and the biggest thing on there is torque. Torque is power. How is my engine performing? So that's how you kind of remember that this is the primary engine data display. The alternate, well, in the event that the primary doesn't work, I still need some of that data. This is the alternate engine data display. It has torque. It has ITT. It has N1. So it has all of the things, or the primary things, that the primary has, but in an alternate form, whether it's a digital printout or just a smaller readout. And then obviously the last one would be the engine systems display. This one tells me about my engine health, kind of like in your car with your oil pressure and your oil temperature. So it's got temperature and pressure. It also has your hydraulics and then your electrical health. So that's your engine systems display. So that's an easy way to remember it. Primary and alternate both have torque on them. The engine systems display is just your, your, your health of your engine oil, oil temp, hydraulics, electrics. Does that kind of help? Oh, I forget which one's which. The nice thing is that cutout right there that I have up here on the board is actually in your testing cubicle on the left-hand side. Don't look to the right. That's very confusing. It's a T38. You guys don't need to worry about that. They use our testing lab as well. 
Just remember the one on the left, those, that picture is presented for you. So you don't have to remember, oh yeah, where was that gate? Oh yeah, it's right here. So you can use that to kind of assist you if needed. All right, we're gonna talk about all that stuff. All right, so on the primary engine data display, which is the upper right display for your, for your engine cluster, cluster, torque, that's the power in the aircraft. It's got your interstage turbine temperature, ITT, that's your exhaust gas temperature, EGT, for folks that, go ahead. So what's the difference between the RITT and the ITT? The ITT is processed through the EDM, the engine data ma manager. The raw ITT is just a direct readout source to the cockpit. One's processed, one's not. Go ahead. What would be the difference between those values? There usually isn't. Okay. I don't, I don't, off the top of my head, I can't think about why those two would be different unless there was a malfunction with the EDM, but they should normally be the same. Was that your question? Well, I was going to ask what you exactly mean by process, but maybe. The engine data manager for, to process that and put it on the display, it, it goes through a gonculation. I don't know why it doesn't report the raw ITT, but it's not important for, for our purposes. One's a direct source, one's processed. So the raw ITT would be more I don't know if it's more accurate. It's just a different way to report the same information. Okay. The gas generation section, that's the N1. That's the speed that the compressor turbine is running at. That typically runs fairly, fairly high. Propeller RPM, we already talked about that. In flight, it's going to be operating at 100 NP or 100% of its capability or 2,000 RPM. Indicated outside air temperature, it's not that valuable other than for potentially engine starts on hot days. So anything above a certain temperature, you're gonna to wanna to do what's called a dry motor start. But luckily for us, it's typically right around 15 for most of our sorties, so we don't have to worry about that. All right, the alternate engine data display, just like on the primary, the primary had the big round dial for torque, we have a digital readout for the same, for the same torque setting. We also have the raw ITT, which we've already talked about. Again, that's not processed by the EDM. N1 also displayed on, on the alternate engine data display. And then we've got cockpit altitude. So during your climb check, when you're flying around, you're going to be taking note of the cockpit altitude. What that means is as the aircraft is climbing, pressurization in the aircraft begins at 8,000 feet. Most commercial aircraft, it's about 6,000. So as you're climbing, that's when you start feeling the popping in your ear. Well, that's, that's what you're gonna check. So at 10,000 feet, this better read eight or your cabin's not pressurizing. And then there is a delta, fee, delta P. That's a pressure differential between the outside uh, pressure and the inside of the cockpit. So you're just gonna make sure that that's within limits. And then that's your fuel flow in pounds per hour. Fuel quantity, this one gets messed up by you guys all of the time. Okay, bless you by the way. How much fuel do I have on board? Seven. 700? 740. 740? Yeah, it's hard to interpolate between the needles. So basically you have 3.5 times two is seven, times 100, you have 700 pounds of fuel. I didn't design it, don't, don't, don't shoot me. I would have put a totalizer in right there instead of L and R. I would have put like exact number, but you can blame the Navy. It's more fun to blame them. Sir, um, in the reading it said this told you how much is in your collector tank as well. Exactly which part of that chart tells you what's in your collector tank versus what's in your wings? It's a good question, okay. Both wings have their set amount of fuel. Let's say we have, uh, now you're gonna make me do math. We have uh, 360 in both wings. No, not 360. We have uh, 330 in both wings. And then we have 40 in the collector tank. That 40 is cut in half and 20 is given to each of the wings. So that 20 is accounted for here. So, so to your answer your question, there's always 40 in the collector tank, 
and that's split equally and added to the wing fuel. But we'll get to that on when, Wednesday afternoon. You're way ahead. Blanket party? No, I'm kidding. All right, then engine systems display. We've got the oil temperature and pressure. You got the hydraulic pressure, and then DC volts and amps. The one thing on the DC volts and amps, both batteries in the T6 are 24 volt batteries. The generator, starter generator, runs at 28 volts. So I know that my generator is operating correctly if I see approximately 28 volts. Just like in your car, what's your battery rated at? It's a 12 volt battery. But what's your alternator rated at? 14. So when you're driving down the road and you look down at your volts, it's going to be something probably higher than 12. Why? Because your alternator is powering your system and giving a trickle charge to your battery. The generator is powering the system, and oh, look at that, it's giving a trickle charge to your battery. So if this is positive, that means your battery is accepting power. But we'll be covering that this afternoon. Typically in the, in the T6, if there's something that's outside that green band, so on these let me back up a slide. Typically, if something exceeds or falls below the green band on your engine systems and or alternate and primary engine data display, you'll get some enunciators, i.e. red boxes, maybe some yellow boxes, yellow needles. Those also may correspond to a caution and warning system light on your caution and warning system panel as well. Not always. Like if you were to lose all of your hydraulic pressure, you're not going to get a light on your caution and warning panel. You, pilot, have to see that. That would be an example of that. But normally, if things are exceeded, you'll get some sort of indication on the gauge itself. Anytime you do get an exceedance and it makes either a red or amber light appear on your CWS panel, you're going to get the oral warning tone corresponding to the red master warning or the yellow master caution items. Okay, stop that. There. We just advanced the slide. So again, anytime you get the, one of those exceedances that corresponds to one of those, you get the oral warning decaying tone like that. The appropriate, if it's a yellow caution and warning light, you'll get the master caution. If it's a red light, you'll get a warning light. And that will continue until you acknowledge it as the pilot. Depress the caution and or warning light, acknowledging what it is on your panel. Overheat detection system. Go ahead. Uh, pressing the warning button, will that just get rid of the, the audible or will it uh, like get rid of the warning light as well? All right, good question. So I'm flying my T6. Everything's cool. Whoop, whoop. I get that oral tone in my headset. I look up. I got a red light on my uh, flashing red light, master warning light. I look down. I got the cockpit altitude light. It's red. Okay. So the first thing I do is I go, oh, I got a red light. Do I have a fire light? No, I look down at my panel. Oh, I've got that light on my panel. Then when you press and extinguish that, that light goes out and that tone goes out. But that situation will still remain on your panel. It's just telling you, hello, pilot, look down here because you got a problem. That's all it's for. It's too bad my wife didn't have that in the car when she ran the engine out of oil. OK, anyway. <clears throat> Hey, come on now. You can't pick on her. All right, overheat fire detection system. Like we talked about on that first schematic of the, of the engine, those two wires that f basically go around the cold and hot sections of the, of the engine, those are the fire loop one and fire loop two. All right, those are inner tw twisted all around the engine. They'll work if they're bent, twisted, kinked, smashed. 
They just won't work if they're physically compromised, if they're broken. All right, if there is a point source of heat or the ambient heat within the cock or within the engine compartment rises to a certain temperature, let's say it's over here, it's going to travel back to the, who comes to the fire? The fire responders. So that signal goes to the fire responders. The fire responders send the signal to the, to the cockpit and it's either fire loop one and or fire loop two that illuminate. If it's both due to an ambient temperature within the engine compartment, they're probably both gonna go. If it's just point source to one of them, it may only set off one. They're so close together though, it'll probably set both of them off. There's two of them so that the system's redundant. Fire loop one's on the battery bus typically and or the aux battery in the event of battery bus failure. Guess where fire loop two is? It's on the generator bus. What's this component right up here? Generator. Starter generator, thank you. So this goes back to your question. Hey, I've got a master warning. I'm gonna go across and look and go, oh, that corresponds now to a firelight. I wonder if there was a build with that one. No, okay. So, Changing it up slightly, the caution and warning panel lights, the yellow or the amber and red lights correspond to the master warning and master caution lights respectively. Additionally, the fire, the fire light, fire loop one, which is on the top and fire loop two, which is on the bottom, those also correspond to the master warning light to give you the tone as well. It'd be kind of silly to be flying around everything's great and meanwhile you've got a firelight just illuminated on your dash and it's not letting you know. So yes, that is tied into the system as well. All right, we're gonna go through some, some normal and abnormal stuff and then some questions. All right, where did I leave off? I think I left with you. What are the, what are the uh, abnormal engine start possibilities? Yep, that's one. Hot? No. Yep. Mm hmm And no start. Very good. So hot, hung, and no start. Pretty much like it says, hot, I get some sort of potential exceedance in my operating limits for the temperature for engine start. Hung start, it gets up to a certain speed and then it just doesn't continue on. And then a no start, Nothing happened. Okay, and we're going to go through those. But before we do that, you guys got to see how a normal start works. It's kind of dumb to talk about, hey, these are all the problems with starting, and we didn't get a chance to see the actual start. So right now we're going to be doing a battery start. Obviously, the generator is not on because we have 23.6, which is pretty decent voltage. What you're going to see is when the, when the uh, video starts, the pilot takes the starter switch and puts it in the auto reset position. We're assuming that the start ready light, on, start ready light is on, i.e. the PCL is in the proper starting position. Okay, those are things we can't see on the CWS panel. But when he throws the starter switch, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see a huge voltage drop. N1's gonna start, why is N1 gonna start? Yeah, the starter's turning the, the, air, the air generation section, the gas generation section. It's turning that. Once that starts turning, fuel is introduced, and you'll see fuel flow down here. At about that time when fuel is introduced, you'll get light off. Those, exciter, those uh, igniters through the exciter box and cables light that fuel off. And then what you'll start to see is the ITT starts coming up. Now the T6 is unique on how it starts. It starts, that, that whole start sequence that I just talked about initiates, and then as the ITT starts to climb, N1 is coming up as well. So you'll get your first peak in ITT at 27N1. You'll get the hottest, typically the hottest, ITT at 37N1, and then at 47N1, it starts to go towards flight, or to ground idle, and then it'll cool down the rest of the way. 
I know I just threw a lot out there, but looking for those things now, when you watch the video, it will make sense. <clears throat> All right, through the starter switch, notice the huge voltage drop. N1's coming up. Fuel flow. Now I have light off. 27N1. That's my first peak. Now, 655. Now it's going to continue up. At 37N1, that should be my max. A little warmer. And then under the engine section, there's an abort start procedure. It says PCL off or starter switch to auto reset. Magic. So the checklist will tell you what to do in that particular situation. So typically on the engine start, I reach down, I go starter switch auto reset. I come back here, I hack the clock, and then I put my hand on the PCL. Now I'm monitoring it. If I see a problem, that's all I have to do. I have to just bring my hand back instead of reach down and try to find the auto reset switch. So you can do either one. It's just I find it easier because I've got my hand resting there on the PCL and I can rock it back. Sir? At that point, it's not over the, it's not over the D-head yet, so you don't have to do the fingerless. Correct. So you just go straight back to the cutoff. Very good. Yeah, the starter, or I'm sorry, the start ready position on the PCL lives in the cutoff band. So there is a small band in the cutoff range where start ready lives. So you just advance it about an inch or so, the PCL, and you'll get the green start ready light. It's even before it goes into the idle detent. So it lives back in the cutoff range. Good, qu good question, thank you. Begin the abort start procedure we already talked about. What are the types of abnormal start? Very good. That's like the what, the 12th time it's asked, either in the CBTs or in this courseware. You'll probably see that again. I'm just guessing. What's the indication of a hot start? Uh, your ITT probably is going away. Rapidly or high rising ITT, what else? Yeah, NP and N1 are probably going to be low. So the ITT is outpacing the N1 and NP. Look at that. 100%. Good job. I would say take the rest of the day off, but then I get in trouble. All right. What are the indications of a hung start? Okay, it could be both of those. I know the coursework says uh, slow rising N1, but if you think about it, if the core of the engine only comes up to a certain amount and fuel is still there and it's not exhausting that burnt f or expended fuel, you may get a rise in ITT as well. So those two things could happen. What's a no start? Okay, very good. Yeah, so with a no start, the big giveaway is going to be, hey, do I have all the ingredients? Yes. Why am I not getting ITT? That's probably the dead giveaway. All right, so continuing on with abnormal operations, the next one, obviously, after the engine start, we've got engine failure in flight. Identify indications of engine failure in flight. So we're flying her along. What's the first thing we're going to notice if our engine fails? Yeah, loss of thrust. It gets quiet. Who did gliders at some point in their careers? Glider training. I did. Very scary, flying without a motor. Okay, I'm just going to say, throw that out there. But you're going to see a loss of uh, power and airspeed. Most of your gauges, engine associated gauges are going to start winding back. Hey, my ITT is going to start to drop off. My torque, obviously, is going to fall off. My N1, all of those things are going to start to decay. You're going to get some warning, warning lights. 
Most students refer to the warning lights that you're going to get with an engine failure as the goof lights. You're going to get a generator light, an OBOGS light, a oil pressure light, and a fuel pressure light. Those are typical, at least as a minimum, when you have an engine failure in flight. And then the prop's going to move towards feather. Why? Because that oil pressure from the PIU is starting to disappear. It's going to move towards feather. It's not going to feather. Why? Why will the PCL not, or I'm sorry, why will the propeller not feather with an engine failure? What has to happen? Go ahead. Exactly. I haven't activated the feather dump solenoid. I haven't taken oil out of that piston to drive it to feather. So I have to put the PCL in the cutoff position. So if you think about the bold face, I forgot what it is. Does anybody know? Any, who wants to throw it out there? Does anybody know? Go ahead. Uh, I think it's PCL off and firewall shut off and bolt. No. Good try, though. I like it. That is all the way lean forward. Go ahead. <laughs> Correct. Zoom Glide 125. Hey, got to keep my airspeed up. What's the next step? PCL off. Okay. So with PCL off, that's going to feather my prop to give me my best glide performance. So that's what we need to do. So it's going to move towards feather. It's not going to feather. But good try. Good try. <laughs> These were the lights I talked about. Generator, fuel pressure, oil, and OBOGs, the goof lights. So engine failure during flight, that is a checklist. Notice the first three steps are the bold face. And then step four is air start attempt if warranted. How many engines do I have on the T6? One and only one. It'd be nice to get it back. So there is a bold face for immediate air start as well. I'm not going to crush you on that one, OK? <laughs> so what would cause our engine to fail? Give me some examples. We took a bird down the intake, and it got jammed into the engine, maybe. So it could be FOD. Could be a compressor stall, air disrupted into the engine, or fuel starvation. Fuel would probably be the most likely cause. Based on the design of the T6 engine with that reverse airflow, it'd be really tough to get something in into the engine. But um, true story, kind of funny, kind of sad, actually. Two IPs went cross country, and uh, the next morning they got up, and they left all of those little um, uh, from the walk around, you saw all the little, you know, remove before flight, like the pillows that go in certain, uh, to prevent like animals from getting in there or whatever. Well, they quick ran around the airplane, took all the tags off of it. They left the one in the intake, the big banana shaped one. They left that one in the airplane and they flew it all the way back. <laughs> okay. They did get in trouble for that, but I'm just saying it's really tough to fight out the T6 engine. That should be a testament to that. I don't recommend it, but I'm just saying it's been done. So, so yeah, compressor stall, mechanical failure. We did have a rash of uh, prop sleeve touchdowns, which I'll, I'll touch on here in a little bit when we get to the uh, uh, PMU type uh, malfunctions. But that was a rash of things. That was a mechanical issue with the engines. What are some things I'm going to see on my display in the event of a engine failure? Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, OK, so I'll get a master warning light with some of the caution and warning lights on the panel, the goof lights. Is there anything else? OK. Yeah, all of those things. The torque, the N1, the ITT, the caution and warning lights, loss of thrust, very, very quiet. So those type of things are going to take place. PMU failure. For those that have the uh, EP page pulled up on their ETD, it looks like this, your caution and warning panel. There are two lights associated with the PMU. There's a PMU status and a PMU fail. PMU fail is obviously red. PMU status is a yellow or a caution light. 
So indications of a PMU failure, which is a much bigger deal, are, could be what? When that thing fails. Uh, fuel regulation is going to stop. You're going to have to start manually doing that. OK, but it, to the pilot, you're probably not going to see that right away. So what's the first thing you're going to notice? OK, you'll get a PMU enunciator of some kind of status and or fail, probably, with the warning light and the oral tone. What else? Power failure? Power failure? Yeah, you could experience some sort of uh, power change. You're just sitting there fly, flying along. All of a sudden, your NP changes or your N, or I'm sorry, your torque, your N1. Some of that may change. You could get an over torque situation. Go ahead. Yeah, step power change, that's notorious for a PMU failure. So those are all reasons or indications of a PMU failure. And I think it builds it there. Power step changes, there, there you go. PMU fail status, I think you brought that up. Um, and then the oral warning tone. Here's what it looks like. Watch the torque and the NP on this schematic. Why did the master warning and master caution lights go off? We can't see the CWS panel, but why do you guys think it did? Why would the master warning and master cautions come on in this case? Because the master warning is associated with PMU fail and the master caution is associated with the PMU status. So you must have had the PMU lights on as well, in addition to those power slash step changes. Oh, there it is. They're right there. and apply the appropriate procedure. For the PMU status, if you just get a PMU status light, that's a weight on wheels discrepancy. One of the squat switches isn't working. So all, that, all that's going to mean is when you land on the ground, instead of the idle, flight idle, come, or I'm sorry, instead of the aircraft going back to 60 to 61 N1 on the ground, it's going to fail at 67. So your ground roll may be a little bit longer. That's not a big deal. PMU status isn't a big deal. PMU failure is. And that's because you, pilot, are now responsible for keeping the engine within the operating limits. Uh, power step change, you got your oral tone. Uh, you could have that master before it might come on. Uh, oh, did I say power step change? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're going to get all of those for a PMU failure. You're going to get the power step change, potentially. You may get a high NP. You're going to get the uh, oral warning tone and lights as well. All right, another bold face. Uncommanded power, loss of power, uncommanded prop feather. So we have one bold face. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> TCL midwit range PMU switch dash off uh, prop SYS circuit breaker left front console full uh, comma if NP stable below 40%. Okay, good ish. So we don't say the commas, the dashes, and the left front console. It's just the stuff that you're writing down. So PCL mid range P PMU switch off prop assist circuit breaker pull if NP stable below 40%. Okay, so we just say prop assist circuit breaker, we don't say SYS. Okay, so uncommanded power changes or loss of power, this could be due to the PMU problem that we were just talking about. So we, we would want to do that. So the reason the bold face is written the way it is is to accomplish a couple of things. One, PCL mid-range, why do we want to bring the PCL back to some middle power setting? Why? To prevent an over torque. Why? Because the next step, I'm turning the PMU off. So I leave the PCL up at max, I turn the PMU off, whoop, I just over torque the engine. So those two kind of go hand in hand. So I do that regardless of any of the situations that we just talked about. Uncommanded power, uncommanded prop feather, those type of things. The last step is reserved for one and in, in only one situation, which is what? The uncommanded prop feather. I'm going to pull the feather dump solenoid circuit breaker, the prop cyst circuit breaker. I'm going to pull that.
to allow oil to go back in there and change the pitch of my prop. It went to feather and I didn't want it to go there. So I'm going to de-energize it, keeping oil in there. So uncommanded power, just like it says, I'm flying along and it's either giving me more torque than I'm asking for. It's doing power or step changes that I don't want it to do. So the engine's acting in a way I don't want it to, that I'm not making it do that. So right here, you can see that it's decaying and I didn't, and I didn't do anything. So my NP is still good at 100, but I lost all my torque. Hey, I don't want it to do that. That situation may lead me to think that I've got an engine failure. But if I don't have any goof lights and my NP is still at 100, then that may not be the case. So a thorough review of my engine instruments would tell me that I have got an uncommanded power change. Uncommanded prop feather. The way you're going to be able to tell if you've got an uncommanded prop feather or your teeth are going to fall out. What I mean by that is the aircraft's going to violently vibrate because the prop just went from some fine to coarse position to feather. And now it's pushing all of that air and it's just beating itself to death. So the NP is going to drop dramatically. You're going to have very low NP. The torque's going to skyrocket because Mr. Engine's trying to keep that boat paddle spinning in the air at 2,000 RPM. So the NP is going to uh, drop and the torque is going to go really high. And that's what you can see there. Loss of power, obviously, because the prop is not in its commanded position. You're going to get high torque and low NP. Engine vibration and noise, absolutely, you're going to see that. We had an instructor here that lost one of the counterweights on the propeller. He's just flying along, all of a sudden the counterweight came off, and so the whole prop mechanism was out of balance. He said it was so violent, the vibration, he couldn't read the engine instruments. It was just that violent. So, like I said, it's going to vibrate pretty dramatically if this happens. And here's the build for it. So you're flying along, you push the torque up, but look at the NP. Most students struggle with these type of engine related malfunctions because you're so conditioned by this point to stare at the torque, you forget about the NP. So remember, engine health is all of these, N1, NP, and torque. So make sure you're looking at all of those if there's anything that looks potentially abnormal. All right, prop sleeve touchdown. We used to have these before we had the, uh, br we went from a brass fitting on the torque tube that goes from the turbine section to the reduction gearbox. That sleeve, if you will, where the uh, torque shaft is spinning w had uh, oil in it. And the brass fitting was allowing oil to, to come out of that. So you're having metal to metal contact, slowing the propeller down. So you'd be flying along and all of a sudden your NP would go, 60 and then back up to 100 and then go 40 and then back up to 100. So uh, they replaced all of those brass fittings with, uh, I believe it's nickel or silver and we haven't, we haven't had any problems since. Okay. But they, it took a while to swap all of those out. The other thing that we, we got a few times was the chip light. Because of that metal on metal in the torque shaft touching, that metal would migrate down into the bottom of the reduction gearbox, and the, the chip detector would pick that up. So prop sleeve touchdown, first two steps of the uncommanded power bold phase usually would alleviate that and allow the aircraft to recover. So this is pretty accurate. Loss of oil pressure to propeller pitch control me me mechanism for momentarily contact between the oil transfer sleeve and the propeller shaft. Basically that sleeve was running out of oil and then you were getting metal to metal contact slowing it down. That one was unfortunately fairly common. In the, I don't know how many hours are on the PT6 engine now, I think there's like 40 or 45 million hours on it. We've never had an uncommanded prop feather, but you guys all experience it because it's important.
and it's a haze, and it's fun for the IPs. Your pain is our fun. No, I'm kidding. I didn't say that out loud. What are some of the indications of an uncommanded prop feather? Uh, the engine vibration, low NP, rapid loss of power. And high torque. High torque, low NP. And then obviously all the things you said. Noise. Possible PME fail status? I would say no. All right. Engine fire and flight. How do I know if I get an engine fire and flight? Okay. I might see a fire. What else may I get? The fire light. The fire light on the enunciator panel. One and or both. Is that enough to just go, ooh, I got a fire light. Mm, do the bull face. Look how good I was. Is that enough? What's the bull face title of that? If fire is confirmed. You only have one engine. You better confirm that you have a fire before you shut it down. That's a, that's a typical student error. You'll be flying around. I'll give you a fire light. You're like, ooh, look at how fast I was. Yeah, it was just a light. You don't have any indications. Good job, though. Okay, so fire and flight, like you said back, back there, Mr. Class Leader, you may get the actual fire. For our purposes, though, in the cockpit, you're going to see the fire warning enunciator and the master warning to include the oral warning tone. To confirm it, we do what's called a fever check, fluctuating fuel flow and or fluids, excessive ITT, visual indications, erratic engine operation, and roughness. Those are ways that we go about on every single EP looking at the health of our engine to determine if we have a fire. Go ahead. Okay, so I get a fire light. Now I continue my investigation and my engine just vibrating excessively. According to the dash one, that is a fever indication which would validate the light that you have. So these are items that would validate the situation that's presented to itself. Obviously, smoke coming out of the exhaust stacks, flames coming out of the cowling, melting paint. Those are all going to be indications that you have an engine fire. Go ahead. Do we need to know the bold face for this test? On Thursday? Bold face on the test? No. Because your PR 107 will be your bold face and obsolete exam. And I think that's scheduled for? Two weeks out. Two weeks out. OK. Possible causes, the things that burn in the engine compartment. Remember, that thing's crazy hot. It's like 500, 600 degrees centigrade. So a fuel line rupturing, that's definitely going to probably cause a fire. Oil getting all over the inside of the cowling, that would be a problem as well. So those would be typical things that would cause a fire. Fire and flight, bold face. Redemption. The Tosh.0 redemption. Here we go. So, um, PCLR and firewall Correct. No and in there. Good. That was easy, though. Baby steps. OK. Let's see. What are some of the indications of a fire and flight? Um, so the indications were all the fever, but sensory indications? Or like yeah. What else would you get besides a fever, obviously? No. Fire light, the oral tone. Uh, Master warning, fire light combination, and the oral warning tone, in addition to all the fever. All right. Review questions. We'll just continue on. Sir, uh, what's your ITT at? 550 degrees Celsius. Yes, it is not 95. Don't miss that on the exam. That happened last class. Don't do that. Read the question. I would say RTFQ, but you guys already know what that means. OK. The power turbine is driven by? Think of it.
Think about eating tacos. <laughs> Expanding gas is very good. Okay, so this is, I think, a poorly done question. Not only does it turn the turbine, but it turns this, which is what? The compressor. It turns both of them. So both the compressor and the turbine, i.e., the gas generation section and the turbine section, are driven by, altogether, expanding gases. I got a fever. I need more cowbell. What's fever stand for? Uh, fluctuating oil pressure, temperature, hot uh, hydraulic pressure, excessive turbine temperature, visual smoke or flames, erratic engine operations, roughness, or vibration. Almost like you read it. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, 11248, which is our driver's ed manual that goes along with our dash one, which is the owner's manual. That talks about fluctuating fuel flow as well. So I always say fluctuating fluids, and it co accomplishes all of the things that we're talking about here. You'll be very intimately familiar with the FEVER acronym. What are the three engine sections? Okay. Uh, accessory compartment. Um, Uh, accessory compartment, uh, the gas generation section, the power compartment section. Correct. Three types of abnormal starts. Hot, hung, and no start. Correct. Hot, hung, and no. Question? What are the functions performed by the, P uh, the PMU? Okay. Uh, processes power requests and uh, maintains a near linear power curve. Couldn't have said any better. Great. Good answer. What's the purpose of the PIU up on top of the engine there? It uh, adjusts propeller angle. Uh, correct. Jet, in, in essence, he's correct. It regulates the oil pressure into the pitch change mechanism per the demands of the PMU. What's wrong with the N1? <laughs> okay. No, that's, that's a fair assessment. Why is it out of limits, though? Right, so like we said, when things exceed the normal operating range, typically, They'll have either a yellow or red box, or the needles will change color, et cetera. So it's exceeding its operating limit. What are, the, what are some of the causes that we would lose our engine in flight? Uh, fuel starvation, uh, mechanical failure, or compressor stall. Or IP. We had a situation at Laughlin where IP is riding in the back seat. This is before the... PCL cutoff finger lift guard was installed. Riding with his, his arms like this, student coming in for a rejoin, has a vector towards the lead airplane. He's like, ooh, I gotta take the airplane. And slaps the PCL back. So his hands were up here and he just reached down and went like that. What do you think happened? When he went like this, the scooping motion, he lifted up the PCL cutoff finger lift and shut the engine off. <laughs> so he panicked like anyone would do. Oh, what did I do? So he did the bold face wrong. Cooked the motor. After the 37th unsuccessful engine start from 15,000 feet, the student said, hey, sir, this tree is getting really big. We need to get out of here. They lived. But that, let that be a lesson to you. Do the bold face correctly. This, oh, that's privilege safety information. Don't share that outside the room. OK, this display shows the hydraulic pressure at what? What's of that? Hydraulic pressure. That is a pressure, but that is the oil pressure. Hydraulic pressure is down here. Right there.
I'm sure you'll be signing up for EI later. <laughs> Only Academy guys know that. It's extra instruction. Okay. What are the engine warning indicators? Engine fire warning indicators. We kind of already touched on it. Go ahead. Yeah, I think this question is talking just about the cockpit indications. So the only tool we have to us is the warning light, the tone, and the fire lights themselves. I think that's what this is talking about. Yeah. And like you said, fever, that would also be a validation of that. Po possible causes of uncommanded power loss? Um, if your PMU is Bingo. Mm hmm. Contamination could be a PMU problem. It could be the that dreaded uncommanded prop feather that's never happened either. What are the three elements necessary for engine operation? Very good. What are some possible indications of an engine fire that may be seen on your displays? Um, the fluctuating, fluctuating fluids. Correct. Absolutely. All righty. All right, you guys are now opted for the next two lessons. They're going to be on the electrical section.